let's start this very nice book launch. Good afternoon, dear attendees, dear colleagues. My name is Daniela Vono, and it's my pleasure and honor to host the launch of the book Towards Bayesian Model-Based model Demography, written by Jakub Biak in collaboration with a team of nine authors. In addition to Jakub, three members of the team are here with us today, Martin Hinch, Sarah Nurse, and Adelinde Urmacher. I'm also delighted to welcome two amazing scholars who will serve as panelists today. Alexia Fuenkrantz Perskavets, Professor in Mathematical Economics at the Vienna Institute of Technology and Deputy Director of the Vienna Institute of Demography at the Austrian Academy of Science. And Professor Franz Willikens, Honorary Fellow at the Netherlands Interdisciplinary Demographic Institute and Emer Emeritus Professor of Demography at the University of Groningen. We have announced that Eric Silverman from the University of Glasgow would be also be here with us today, but unfortunately, he couldn't make it due to health issues. Nonetheless, he wrote some words that we'll gladly share uh, before we, we enter to the second part of the event, which will be the panel discussion. So the, the, the book towards Bayesian model-based demography starts with four words by Daniel Courgeau, Director of Research Emeritus at the French National Institute for Demographic Studies. His contribution helped us to understand the context and importance of this book. Unfortunately, he couldn't join us today, but uh, we are going to make use of his own words to introduce a bit uh, the background of this book to, to all of you. Uh, first, he mentions that this book is perfectly in line with the aim of the Springer's Method of Series as it develops micro foundations for migration and other population studies through the development of model-based methods involving Bayesian statistics. This line of thought follows and completes two previous volumes of the series. First, the volume Probability and Social Science, which Dr. Cujo published in 2012. And second, the volume Methodological Investigations in Agent-Based Modeling, published by Eric Silverman in 2018. Dr. Cujo goes on and highlights that Francesco Billeri and Alexia von Kranz Praskavets, who is here with us today, they were the first to introduce in 2003, the agent-based approach to demography, which was already in use in many other disciplines since 1970s. These methods were then further developed by others, including Professor Franz Willikens, who is also here with us today. Professor Biak was one of the first demographers to use Bayesian models, specifically for migration forecasting in 2010. In that first paper, he showed that Bayesian approach can offer an umbrella framework for decision making by providing a coherent mechanism of inference. In the book we are launching today, Professor Biak and his colleagues provide us with a more complete and updated analysis of Bayesian modeling for demography, while also covering other important points that the reader will discover in the book, such as international migration theory, simulations in demography, cognition and decision making, computational challenges solved, replicability and transparency in modeling, and many more. Dr. Cujo finishes his contribution by stating, I greatly hope that the reader will discover the importance of these approaches, not only for demography and migration studies, but also for all other social science. So with no further words, <clears throat> it's my pleasure to hand over to Professor Jakub Bijak, who will offer us a short presentation on the contents of the book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Thank you to everyone for joining us for this launch and huge thanks to Population Europe for hosting it. So we would like to talk about the, the upcoming book towards Bayesian model-based demography. And the book, actually the book was supposed to, to be released last month, but there were some, some production delays which were beyond our control, which means that it's still, still in print as we speak. But to make up for that, all the, all the registered participants who, who registered for this event will receive a link uh, once the book is out. And as the book is open access, uh, it, and it will be coming in, in on, on Springer website anytime 
anytime soon. We hope that that we will be able through this launch event, we'll be able to whet your appetite and, and just showcase a bit what's inside uh, the cover. So we will we will take you through the the, the book itself first. Uh, the it's coming it's coming up in the series as, as Daniela mentioned it's coming up in the Methodos series which is a, a methodological uh, series of Springer covering a broad spectrum of topics across social sciences and in today's event myself Martin Sarah and and Lynn will present snippets from the book just to just to show you what's in it and then we will we will hand over to our esteemed panelists to, to ask them what they think about it and, and uh, basically uh, solicit their reflections on the, on, the, on the book as well as on the ideas that we've implemented in the, in the research that we are showing in. So what, what's inside? We wanted to develop a model that would describe a real life process of migration through the lens of agent-based modeling, but with agents being sort of as cognitively plausible as, as, as uh, they could be with respect to the way they make decisions. And by doing so, what we really wanted to achieve is to bring together the, the, not only the social science, the social theory, but also behavioral theory and embed this in the broader framework of Bayesian experimental design, so hence the Bayesian in the, in the name, by putting together qualitative and quantitative elements of data, modeling, and uh, experiments, uh, both computational and, and psychological. And the motivation for, for, for that was, as you can, as you can see, the, the Syrian asylum migration, especially the, the, you know, the, the project this book is uh, based on, was launched soon after the peak of the of the influx of the asylum seekers from Syria into into Europe, which is uh, which was the you know, and, and still is a very salient, a very high profile event and and process in uh, in demography and human migration studies. So so we wanted to see whether by using models in a specific way we can shed some lights. Some, shed some light on the different aspects of the process. So we started with, with the idea that we have different building blocks that we wanted to put together to help us describe the migration processes, uh, starting from the agent-based model at the core, embedded in a wider framework of Bayesian design of experiments and Bayesian analysis of, of simulation experiments. To do that, we would need data and we would need experimental data as well on, on the cognitive aspects of the agent decision making. And we would also need solutions for implementing the model uh, in, uh, in a you know, specific program, programming language and environment. So, so at, at the outset, what we envisaged was, was, a, was a black box of a complex model with, with, some, with some parameters, generating some predictions and integrating different building blocks uh, quantitative elements, qualitative elements, mechanisms of, of uh, the processes that we are talking about and, and other, uh, other features. So that's where we started, but where we ended up is a question, quite, actually quite a, very, quite a complex and complicated process. So, so here, is a, here is a graph representation of our modeling journey over the past four years when we were working on this uh, on this project integrating different aspects of the data the modeling the analysis and the and the experiment with with the aim of producing uh, migration uh, scenarios uh, in her part of the introduction uh, professor lin ulmacher will talk a bit more about provenance graphs and and uh, why they are important for describing such models and modeling endeavors as this one so what's, what's in the book? What's under the cover? The, the book has three parts. The first part is, is, a, is a philosophical introduction to and inspiration to, to, to model-based demography, which basically sets out the scene and, and uh, tries to 
tell where we are coming from. Why did we opt for the solutions that we that we are testing in this in this book and in this piece of research? Then in the second part, we present in turn five building blocks of the of the approach we propose. So agent-based models, data and, and knowledge uh, under, underpinning the, the empirical side of the analysis, the, the Bayesian statistical ele elements, so the uncertainty, quantification, calibration, and sensitivity analysis, cognitive aspects, so, so the cognitive experiments and, uh, and the ways of including psychologically realistic information in the models, as well as programming languages and, and environments. So that's, that's in part two. And then in the third part, we aim at integrating all of that in an in a increasingly more realistic, we hope, models of migrant journeys. And then we make reflections about the use of modeling and model-based approaches for, for science as well as for, for, for policy making. And we conclude with a few remarks about replicability, transparency, and the general perspectives for the modeling processes. So that's, that's the book in a nutshell. It was written by, by the 10 of us. So, so I would like to, to, to warmly acknowledge and thank all the team of authors for, for you know, tremendous efforts over the past few years uh, in contributing to different aspects of this work and, and the book. And now I will hand over to, to my colleagues. So Martin, Sarah, and, and Lynn will talk about the parts uh, of the work that we are presenting in the book. I'll hand over to, to Martin now to talk about the model. OK. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview over some of the modeling that um, went into the book. Um, uh, first, to give a bit of context, um, uh, the, the model uh, focuses specifically on the migrant journey. There's, there are some reasons for that, mostly that this is something that has not been done a lot in the past. So what we're looking at is only the process from the starting with um, the moment people leave their home up to the point where they reach their destination. Um, we looked at various different uh, research questions, but the basic model that underlies the uh, work we have done is, is has always the same structure and uh, that's uh, what we're showing here. So we have agents that move um, through a landscape that consists of uh, cities and connections between those. Um, they explore their surroundings while doing that um, and start building some kind of internal model of the environment that can be but does not have to be accurate. They communicate with each other and exchange information and then based on that internal model of the environment, they decide on the best path to take to their destination. Um, and then we have a few uh, modifications um, that are also um, part of them are described in the book as well. So we added, for example, fatalities or we let uh, agents uh, behave differently um, when they're faced with uh, risky uh, scenarios with political interventions and so on. Next slide, please. And um, those are just two examples of the, of the work we've done. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see um, the results from a, a theoretical study using that model. So what we were interested in was how um, information exchange influences the, the emergence of migration routes. So on the, on the, um, in the lower panels, you can see uh, the scenario if um, agents are fully informed from the outset and um, in the end, they all converge to the to a, a perfect migration route. And in the upper part, you can see a scenario where agents have to rely on the information they either um, collect from the environment or exchange with each other. And the two graphs on the side uh, show the unpredictability in the respective scenarios. So um, as you can see, for, for an um, information exchange scenario, unpredictability is, unpredictability is much higher. And on the right-hand side, um, basically the same model is used to um, infer the effects of political interventions in a real-life scenario. So for that, um, we calibrated the model to um, real data from the Mediterranean. So we used um, 
uh, fatalities, arrivals, and um, interceptions to calibrate various parameters of the model. Um, built uh, a map from the, the most important cities in the, around the Mediterranean, and then uh, looked at the effects of, an, of a government information campaign on um, migration in that particular instance of the model. So we assumed that, that government agents would uh, distribute information on, um, on risks uh, among agents and then uh, want to see what happened in that scenario. Um, yeah, that, I think that's it from my side. Um, I will hand over to Sarah now. Thanks, Martin. Um, yeah, so there's lots of secondary data um, available on Syrian migration to Europe, which is one of the reasons that we um, chose this migration flow for our, our case study for this project. Um, as you can see here, we've produced a new online inventory um, with sources categorized by topic, um, data type, um, and level of detail. Um, next slide, please, Jakob. And you will see that we've also produced um, a quality assessment of each source across a range of criteria, um, which enables us to identify the likely bias and variance of the data um, for inclusion in the model. Um, while there is a considerable amount of data available, um, only a handful of sources uh, proved useful for our model um, due to the specific research questions that we were uh, addressing. Thanks, Jacob. So we've also carried out um, primary data collection for this project to help us um, to design mechanisms of the model more realistically. Um, firstly, um, psychological experiments um, address specific questions and gaps um, through online studies, um, which inform the way that in agents behave um, with psychological realism. Um, for example, one of our studies looks at the information sources um, used by migrants um, and their subjective judgments of um, the prob probability of a safe journey. Um, we're now also um, in the process of interviewing asylum seekers and refugees in Europe um, to explore whether the themes and mechanisms that we observe um, are what we would expect from our existing analyses. Um, I'll now hand over to Lynn, please, um, to talk about modelling languages. Hello. No. So I'm I'm continuing. Do you see me? I okay, good. Yes. I, okay, if you are developing such a complex model as just uh, described by Martin, you have the question how to do that in a compact manner. And that is actually the goal of domain specific languages. So for starting, what we what we started with was an external domain specific language developed for linked lives. And we uh, yeah, explored how to encode the model within these this external language. On the other side, also Martin implemented the model from scratch in Yulia, the rumors model. And then we did some kind of yeah, comparison referring to the uh, expressibility. And what we found was that the rule-based syntax that ML3 was based upon allowed a very compact and highly accessible description of the model. However, uh, if you saw that the agents have rather complex beliefs, and actually these data structures for these complex beliefs were not included into uh, in within the external domain specific language, which hampered, uh, hampered a little bit the effective modeling and also an efficient simulation. So uh, from that point of view, that was a downside of the external domain specific language. From scratch, we show uh, we at that time there was no really uh, continuous time supported, and also no really separation of concern between modeling and simulator. So everything was thrown together. So from this kind of comparison, what we learned was first of all that, for example, Yulia was improved by now getting an API and adapted adapting the rule-based syntax. Also, the separation of concern was improved. And at that point, we have to see these cut because that is the first part of the first part that is part of the book. And currently, what you will not see in the book, but hopefully soon within another publication, we then designed 
an internal domain-specific language, ML3, which has as a host language, namely Rust. And then we have the rule-based syntax and all the features of Rust, of course, and that gives us the flexibility to support what, what we want to do. And also where we see that these clear separation of concern also have certain kind of possibilities that we exploit for performance, for a really good performance of the tool. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we have one language to rule them all. This is uh, based on our ML3, where you see here now uh, the decision of a migrant uh, where to move. And you see here that, that we have a certain kind of move rate. And the question is, uh, you are now entering the transition and the question is where to go. And you see the, uh, the encoding of this behavior within ML3, the external domain specific language, also the original one. Then you see this in Yulia and you see it in Rust and ML3, so still work in progress. But you see that they are looking rather similar, um, slight variations. And uh, however, what is important to note is, for example, in the Yulia implementation, you see here the agent uh, down here, and that means that the agent needs to be rescheduled because now his kind of time for the next, uh, he decides he moved certain things were now decided for him, and he has now to, to reschedule new, new events or yeah, to schedule new events or to reschedule events already decided upon. This is typically not so so problem within here because here we have one agent, but it becomes a problem, for example, if, uh, for example, location changes the migration policy, then all the agents have to be rescheduled again. So you see here, certain things are a little bit different, yeah, so, but you have to be aware about uh, that as a modeler. Okay, next slide. So modeling is only one of the things that we do and did in this, in this project. What you saw was, uh, what Sara also discussed about was that, first of all, you have all these data analyzes, you have the psychological experiments, and you have, of course, the modeling itself, what Martin did. It's not simply that you start modeling, but you're doing a lot of experiments, you're consulting certain kind of data to do the validation and the calibration, what he talked about. So these are quite complex, complex um, processes. And the question is how to make this accessible. Accessible so that we can better interpret the results of what we achieved. So the question is how do you interpret the model the final model that Martin, after three years or four years of work, Martin, now have there. So how, how did it, how was it generated? And these questions are, how was something, what contributed to something to be? It's typically the question of provenance. So entities, activities, and people involved in producing a piece of data or thing. Yeah. And so this information is crucial for assessing its quality, reliability, or trustworthiness. And this idea we also now also exploited for our project. So to bring together this, how we are bringing together the data analysis, the psychological experiments, the model, the model development, but also the analysis like calibration, validations, analysis, what we are doing with the model. So how are these things put together? work together is part of the provenance model. And you see here, for example, a small extract of the, of the overview that um, Jakob showed you. And here you see then the refinement of the model based on research question, based on new kind of results of new kind of psychological experiments, where then one version of the model is taking as input and then refined, forming a new model, taking these new insights into account. Yeah, and that's from my point of view. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, Sarah and Lynn. And, and uh, as, you have, uh, as you have seen from, from Lynn's comments about uh, provenance, this is also the, this iterative model building process is also something that, that we would like to see as a as a Bayesian inferential learning process where we try to learn 
about the model, the, 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 the increasingly more realistic model to describe a certain social process in an iterative way, whereby we learn new things and learn about the new things to learn. So, so find out where the gaps in our knowledge are and try to fill the gaps with, with appropriate data collection were available. So, so I would like to, to stop the, the, the overview of the, of the book here, just uh, saying thank you to, to all the authors and, and contributors, and also to, to, to colleagues who joined us after this book was already done to, to uh, help us develop some of the ideas further. So special, special thanks to, to, to Ariana Modirusta Galian and to, to Suhila Belabas who joined us for the last stretch of this project where, where we are looking at immersive psychological experiments and ethnographic research that was mentioned by Sarah. And of course, huge uh, thanks to the European Research Council who funded this piece of work. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over back to Daniela for the discussion. Thank you, Jakub, and thank you to all colleagues to, for this fascinating presentation. It's, it's really exciting and I'm looking forward to look deeper to the book when it's launched, which by the way, we will, Jakub already announced, but uh, we'll keep you informed when the book is, is, is available on, on internet as you have registered for the event to send the link. Uh, and also the, the recordings of this meeting will be available on our YouTube channel. So let's move for, to the second part of this event, which is a, a panel debate with Alexia and Franz. So I would like to ask you, perhaps starting with Alexia, from your experience with modeling, what is new in the research presented in this book, in your opinion? Yes, thanks a lot and uh, congratulations, I think, to a wonderful book and I had the chance already to look a little bit into the chapters beforehand of today's panel discussion and I really enjoyed it a lot, I have learned a lot. And uh, just to summarize it in one sentence and then I'll give a little bit more explanations. Let me say it's clearly new, I think, what is presented here. I think what has been really done here is to unify two so far different uh, tracks, I think, in modeling. And one track is agent-based modeling, uh, which we have heard already. And the other track is really to quantify uncertainty in our data, in our models, etc. And this is the Bayesian inference. And I think uh, statistical inference, and this is really what is done in this book. It's to unify, I think, this kind of rule-based modeling, agent-based modeling with the Bayesian statistical inference inference. And now let me explain why I do believe it's so important to do this. And uh, it's also so important to teach our young students to really apply these methodologies. And first of all, let me go back very briefly when in 2003, Francesco and myself started with agent-based modeling. And I'm just citing now from our introduction, we were arguing like that we are really agent-based modeling specifies predefined rules. And out of this rules behavior, we do want, in a sense, to replicate macroeconomic phenomena. I mean, there's a lot of emergent behavior in agent-based models, a lot, of course, of social interactions you can model, heterogeneity, etc. Uh, and then, correctly, about four years ago, Andrew Kroll and also Jan van Pavel, they correctly said, it's not enough. I mean, the ability of the model to simulate and observe the empirical pattern is far from sufficient to prove that the model is valid. And in fact, what they are saying, we should do a race against models, different assumptions. And I think this is exactly what is done in this book. It's really using patient statistical inference at all levels of the modeling procedure. From the input data, they're also combining it with experimental design data, with qualitative data, and the uncertainty in the data, together with the uncertainty in how we understand processes, is extremely important. And then, of course, what you do have to do is at the end to really look at the uncertainty in terms of the output. And I think um, this is exactly what is done and shown in this book and extremely enjoyed, I mean, going through this book by having an example behind it, because then you understand how it works. And I think this was a very smart decision to show everything uh, with an example. 
And let me also say that, uh, as Jakob already mentioned, I think you use this modeling approach to also advance on the models themselves. It should be really something like a loop. I mean, a model, I think, as it is presented here, uh, is really a model which develops dynamically. You should not start with the most complex model. You should build it up, but you should be open to give up some assumptions which are not valid, which are not proven to really show a high certainty of replicating something we would like. Uh, and on the other hand, I think uh, you should refine it. And uh, let me also say, I think in the end, uh, what is also clear in this book, and this I think is a huge bottleneck, uh, we really need many disciplines to work together. And as I think I'm happy to see that there are so many computer scientists involved because that's what we need. And Julia, we ourselves now use it. It's a really useful programming language. We should really learn to our students as well. And it's the combination of mathematicians, demographers, social scientists, computer scientists to get together. And I would have more remarks, but I guess I should stop now. <laughs> this is very interesting because the the comments that Eric sent us just before the, the, the meeting started, he was also reinforcing the importance of transdisciplinary work that uh, was conducted in this book. Very nice. I'll, by the way, I'll, pay, I'll paste here in the chat. And I would also like to invite the attendees to, to, to ask her questions at the, with the Q&A function. You can already start writing questions and then uh, the colleagues will reply in due time. Franz, may I ask you, what are your highlights? You are on mute now. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Jakob and the authors for this uh, book. It is a very important book. And I second uh, uh, Alexia uh, on several views. and. I consider three items, three points that makes this, this book import, uh, important. The first is, of course, the related to Asian-based modeling, but is the emphasis on the mechanistic approach to modeling and illustrated by the roots and rumors model of migration. So the approach received much attention in the work by uh, Frank and Courgeot, as already mentioned, when it's also discussed by Tom Birch in the book on model-based demography. So the main message is that uh, the models in demography should be based on the mechanisms that produce the patterns and the phenomena that we are able to observe. Now, modeling the mechanism is not sufficient, according to the book. Uh, we need the functional structure of the mechanisms. So because many models in demography are process models, but they some emphasize the functional structure, others do not. And uh, so that is uh, what the book says. Now, um, this mechanistic modeling, in my view, is extremely important in demography, but it's not new in demography. I think the Lotka model describes how fertility and mortality combine to generate observed numbers of birds and population age structure. And it says something about asymptotic properties of fertility and mortality regimes. So the Lotka model is probably one of the first that, in my view, is a an, an mechanistic approach to demographic modeling. Now, Fisher's theory of reproductive value is another approach about the same phenomenon and the same mathematical structure, but it has a different theory. And that's also interesting. And that's what the book also shows, that we may have different theoretical perspectives to describe the mechanism that produce the phenomena and the pattern that we are able to observe. That's the first, the emphasis on the mechanistic approach. The second is the use of experiments and as experiments to elicit information. First, the parameters of the um, uh, decision model, the prospect theory model, uh, to elicit the subjective probabilities. And uh, so that is uh, experimental data are used. Now, one, here I have one question that uh, was not addressed in, uh, um, in the presentation. And uh, that is a question that came up to me and I couldn't find an answer in the book. That's why I ask is, who are the participants? Who are the participants in these experiments? I know some experiments you used undergraduate students in Southampton. In another experiment, experiment you used Amazon mechanical truck crowd, crowdsourcing website. And I read about it, but it's not clear uh, what the uh, structure and the background of these participants are 
and how they are related to the subject of your study, namely uh, refugees. That's the second, uh, the importance of experiments in demography. The third is also important, already mentioned, uh, uh, also by Alexia, is how to facilitate the implementation of process models and mechanistic models on the computer. And domain specific language has been discussed uh, by Lynn. ML3 is such a domain specific language is discussed in the book. And uh, domain specific uh, languages are new in demography, but they, they are new in demography but, and well established in computational biology and other fields. So here that's a kind of an illustration where we in demography can learn from achievements in other disciplines. Now, uh, Julia has been mentioned, of course, there are several alternatives and Julia has uh, very uh, uh, important uh, kind of uh, uh, properties, useful properties. But one uh, thing, one issue that may emerge that, uh, by, and that may uh, uh, be posed by re readers of the book says, now here we have two approaches to modeling a domain specific language based on a ger generic uh, computer model and computer language of linked lives, which you can use uh, in uh, uh, matching uh, partnership research in migration and everywhere. And you have Julia, but I'm familiar with R. So why shouldn't I use R? Now, the book says R is slow. That may be very true, but if you use vector-based calculations, R is very fast. So therefore, this is an issue that should be addressed because otherwise we are like in the past that we have a range of options to choose from as far as computer languages are concerned, but people want to have some guidelines on how to choose a particular approach. So that are the three, uh, uh, that's my comments. That are the three major contributions that I see. There are many others, but okay, I focus on three, which is uh, the mechanistic approach, the use of experiments, and the uh, faci to facilitate implementation of mechanistic and process models on the computer. Thank you. Thank you, Franz. Jacob, I see that you would like to share some thoughts. Thank you. I mean, you know, thank you to both of you for for really wonderful summaries. I think it's 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 really. I mean, for, for us, it's very rewarding to see that the message that, that the message is coming through really, really clearly. Because it, it, in fact, this is exactly what we what we were hoping for that the the multi layer applications of the Bayesian inferential mechanism will 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 come through the disc description of uncertainty. Which is which is the and uh, you know what what you France mentioned the 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 theoretical the theory building potential of the models so so one interesting aspect that that we found out here was that actually the the uh, which which was sort of shown in in some of the slides that that Martin was presenting in his part that there is a bit of a trade off in modeling between explanation and and prediction and we we found that because once we once we started calibrating the model to the to the to the data, we found out that that actually the the mechanistic side was losing importance because it was the the data to which we were calibrating the model were becoming dominant in uh, in actually driving the, the 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 model parameters and everything and everything else. So so that that was quite a, that was quite an interesting insight that we took. Uh, you know, it was quite quite surprising and and also. We discuss how how adding different elements to the book, you know, of, of course, increases uncertainty of the modeling outcomes in many ways, but also allows to control this uncertainty where we have good information about some some aspects of the of the process. And the the your question, Franz, about who are the participants of the experiments? I mean, this is this is actually something that we've been grappling with since we started this this work, because as as you rightly say, you know, we started. Pre-pandemic, it was the psychology students in Southampton doing quizzes in, in, a, in a computer lab. Now it's online participants, first on Amazon, now on, on a system called Prolific, who are mostly based in, uh, in Western countries, They're mostly based in countries like United Kingdom or United States. 
we did try to control for for migration background experience and the the facts that that you know whether people have uh, been thinking actively about making migration journeys themselves but we uh, so far we haven't we haven't uh, really we, we don't yet have at this point satisfactory solution to that which is why we embarked on the two additional pieces of work that, that we meant that i mentioned in the in the last on the last uh, slide in my part of the talk so the what we are currently doing now in the experimental part, which Ariana Mordidusta Galliani is, is leading on, we are trying to make the participants imagine that they are part of a story, that they are immersed in a journey themselves, just to, to try to, to, to see whether this makes any difference for the way people respond to these kind of uh, surveys and stimuli in such, such experiments. And in parallel, what we also want to do, and which is which is the, the piece of work that that's Suhila Belabas is, is carrying out, is that we decided to actually interview, have a primary data collection from refugees and asylum seekers, just to just to find out from from the people involved themselves what was it like, what mattered, which of the aspects. Uh, were were really important. So so in in a sense the process it was also a learning process for us. We we did answer some questions, but but by by writing this book by by producing this piece of work we realized that there are still important gaps. We are trying to fill up the two of these gaps now, uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago. But but there are certainly many more to feel. And I'll, I'll leave the question on, on the languages to Lynn as the specialist in the, in the area. Yeah. And Jakob, perhaps I can interrupt just to say that Sophia, Sophia Hill, she just wrote in the chat that uh, code should be coded in C++, but passing them through R. This can be done with the package RCPP. That would also help to broad the audience of users. So perhaps you can also comment on that. Okay, yeah. So, um, yeah, let's me talk about yeah, modeling language. It was quite interesting. I think it was really good for our, for our consortium that we had different two points where we started with the modeling. So there was Martin who really knew Julia well and felt very comfortable, similarly comfortable as you, Sophia, feel in C++ in doing his things in Julia. And we started from that point. We had a language that actually was developed also together with France, ML3. And we started from there and Martin started from there. And the interesting thing really was the learning that we got by comparing, comparing the two implementations, yeah? First of all, we saw that, of course, ML3 as an external domain specific language only for you, uh, so that you know the difference between external and internal. External domain specific language come with their own compiler, so you have to have really the entire, you're really compiling this language, so you can write down everything you want as defined in this language, whereas the internal domain specific language is a little bit closer to what at the end of the day Martin ended up, namely to having an API in Julia. So kind of like that you have certain kind of um, of macros, things like that, so that you have a more compact description. But first of all, what when we compare the two versions, yeah, the first part, yeah, and then we saw that, of course, in ML3, a lot of things were nicely, compactly described, yeah, so, uh, and it was really a compact description that facilitates for other people to reuse what you did, yeah, and that is, of course, the benefit of explicit domain specific languages that you're thinking about the concepts you need and you are preparing them in a way that it makes it very compact and very concise to use. And seeing that, so we both then Martin said, okay, there are some things about ML3 I very much like. Let's see how I get them into Julia. And we said, okay, external domain specific language because we have these complex belief structures and we would have had to have all these complex types re-implemented in ML3 in external language, let's move into an internal ML3 Rust implementation. So in a way, we both got our, got our uh, yeah, inspirations out of these um, 
discussions. But what is really interesting is that the design, how the models look like, yeah, and how they are described very compactly would have not been possible without the previous design of ML3 in the way that at that point Franz and Anna and we developed, namely they inherited this from there. And I think that is that was one of the good things that we what we found. Yeah. So although we would not say ML3 as an external domain specific language to be usable, still it kind of influenced the design of the models so that they are more easy to interpret. And I think that is one of the big problems when you're writing down simply code. First of all, you do not have a clear separation of concern. Still, you saw this with Julia. At some point, you have to do explicit rescheduling because these continuous time, also if you have that discrete event, this, this you have to think a little bit about that. So that is one of the problems. But if you do not have these concepts like also now adapted in Julia with these kind of, okay, how do I write down something like that? Yeah, then I would not say it's kind of like interpretable, the code like a squashed bug, but often it looks for the outsider quite similar. So I think that is in short, my answer to you. It makes sense at least to work as a, it was a benefit, I think, of our project that we had the different perspectives on this problem. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So if, if you are fine with this, this first question, we can move to the second one. And uh, in this part, I would like to explore a bit more about interdisciplinarity in modeling endeavors. Is it worth it? What do you think about it? Which kinds of disciplines should be there? What are the challenges and uh, the benefits of going for an interdisciplinary team? Uh, should I start, Daniela? Or? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so um, I think our discussion already has, I think, uh, lively shown, I mean, that you need this interdisciplinarity because I think the answers came from very interdisciplinary fields, I mean, the questions. And I think this is really, for me, still a little bit of a bottleneck to really have the best practice example, as we see it in this book, to get all these disciplines on one table with the same goal. And I think this interdisciplinarity is not just, I mean, at the beginning, uh, it's really through the whole process. I mean, we need the interdisciplinarity already when we do the calibration of these models. Um, and we do this with social scientists, uh, but we also need good statistical knowledge. We need mathematics mathematical, I uh, think, knowledge, because in the end, when we talk about mechanistic approaches, it means really translating uh, behavior rules into mathematical formulas. And that's not so easy as it's uh, when you read the uh, rules in the end. Uh, and of course, we do need psychology, I think, when we talk about behavior, etc. cetera. Uh, so it really requires a huge interdisciplinary, I think, spectrum already when we set up the model. And uh, this is clear, I think, and what we have learned now through the discussion, uh, if we really go to the step like having such a complex model as it is also shown in this uh, book, I think it really needs also the knowledge of computer scientists, because though we have much better computer facilities as we had 20 years ago and they are improving really continuously, uh, but still, I think it's really sometimes we are running behind the development in computer science uh, in many other disciplines, which means we have to collaborate and should collaborate with computer scientists to really get out the most out of our data and of our models, which means also, and I fully agree, I think, with Franz Lin uh, and others who raised this point, I mean, once people know R or other languages see might to step in in new languages. I mean, that's a huge effort, especially I think if we want these methodologies to be applied by young researchers, because I mean, this is really hard. They don't have the network to collaborate yet, etc. So this is still something I think which needs even more discussion and more advice, I think for young scholars. And the more we make it in a sense, open access resources, which is also clearly uh, outlined in this book chapter, in one of the book chapters, we really have to make it open 
open resource to have to replicate, uh, I think, our models. This is so important, not just to, um, in a sense, like repeat what has been done, but also to learn how it is being done, I think. Uh, this is really important. So you also need interdisciplinarity through the whole model uh, setup, model uh, framework, but also, and this is important, I think the output. I mean, it's discussed very nicely in this book, I think, in the end, I think uh, these models have different purposes. I mean, one purpose could be, for example, to really have predictive power. And uh, in Austria, we have a good example, the whole COVID uh, epidemics was really, in a sense, uh, almost, um, how should I say, <laughs> explained a little bit also by simulation experts. I mean, there's a group uh, of Nikki Popper around at the Technical University have built up, I mean, these models, really agent-based models, feeding them with data, etc. But in the end, to really understand the input and then the output, they need really different uh, areas of research. I mean, there were psychologists involved. I mean, there were epidemiologists involved. Uh, there were medical doctors involved. So also to understand the output of these models requires a lot of interdisciplinarity. And I mean, this is one part. The other part is, of course, that we use these models, I mean, to also build up new theories. And sometimes we also use these models, of course, because we don't have data about phenomena, which we need to have policy advice. So we really use our models for policy advice for non-existing data. And again, let me also cite here one of our own explanation. We do know a lot, of course, of unreported infections and we use the Bayesian Melding method with Miguel Sanchez and uh, Vanessa Tilego to really understand possibly through a model, a simple epidemiological model, but feeding is with data what we have to really deduce data we don't yet have. And on the other hand, when we did this, we had to discuss this with many uh, people, like also epidemiologists, etc. and we were in contact with them regularly. So my point is, yes, you need interdisciplinarity. You need it even more, I think, uh, in all these three steps together. And let me really highlight, I think this is why we need interdisciplinary educations as well. And this is, I think, what we have to work on to really put it into practice, what this book nicely demonstrates. Thank you so much, Alex. Uh, we still have five minutes uh, to go on this book launch, but I would like to give the, the chance for Franz to, to share his thoughts as well. Franz. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. So uh, yes, I also agree that we need interdisciplinary research, but in order to be successful in inter interdisciplinary research, some conditions need to be satisfied. And uh, I could not say it better than Jakob and his team in uh, his book where he says, and, uh, okay, the page eight, 185 for everyone to read, willingness to share other perspectives, open communication, and clear definitions of concepts and ideas so that they can be understood across disciplines. You see, this is a very important statement. If these conditions are satisfied, interdisciplinary research will be successful. Now, I'll give uh, uh, some examples about the need for co good communication and definition from the book. The first is, there's a reference to Gallup's P stochastic simulation algorithm. Now, in my view, it's very well described in Tom Barton's dissertation. You should read it there, it's online, so you can read it. Uh, in my view, it's, it's not different from discrete event simulation. Now, either Gillespie uh, method or discrete event simulation are not concepts we use in demography, but they are the same as competing risk theory. Now, competing risk theory, all demographers know what it is. And they know how it works, and it's exactly the same. Read uh, Tom Warker's uh, dissertation, and uh, you see it. So this is one. The second is Asian-based competition. Uh, sorry, approximate Bayesian competition, also used in the book. Now there are some very nice articles uh, showing the link between Asian uh, uh, approximate Bayesian competition, which is new, and information theory which is not new. And uh, in Asian-based computation, the concept of relative entropy or cross entropy or Kullback-Leibner information diversion is used as a distance measure. 
because the key idea is to compare something you simulate with reality. The question is, what is your measure of comparison? What is your distance measure? So that's something that kind of that link needs to be make, made to make um, interdisciplinary research successful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Franz. I would love to keep going and talking to you about this fascinating book, but we unfortunately have to finalize this, this book launch soon. So Jakub, perhaps you could say some final words. And I would like to thank, thank you. you all for staying with us until the very end. I just, just quickly wanted to react to the, the, the points that both Alexia and Franz made. You know, from our point of view, it was in, in this project, and that's, that's very much my view, and I hope it's also the view of everyone on the team. You know, the, the challenge was not to, to work together. We, you know, I, I enjoyed it tremendously, and learning from one another was, was just a marvelous experience. The challenge was in putting things together. The challenge was in finding the right form for the different elements to fit. So operationalizing the experimental results and operationalizing the, the data assessment so that they can fit into, into the model in an appropriate way. That was, that was something that we spent quite a lot of time and effort and, and, and thinking on. And Franz, you're absolutely right. And I would, you know, the, the clear, clear definitions, I, I think the, the sort of bottom line of understanding was, was paramount. And also I would like to, to, to add to that the, the sort of the embedding of the efforts in the broader framework of the of the you know, scientific discovery and philosophy of science, which is where actually how we start the book in, in the second chapter. So this is, this is where, where we drew inspiration from Daniel Kujus and uh, Robert Frank's work on, on uh, the role of classical inductive reasoning in science and the, principle of, the principles of which we tried to follow in the, in the project and in the, in the book narrative. So I think, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with the call for, for uncertainty and hope, I hope that we have, uh, that we have uh, you know, in, in the book and in the discussion today that we have managed to, to convince you that this was a, a, worthy, a worthy effort. And while, while of course, you know, we, we managed just to scratch the surface on the problems, not to mention on the, on, to the issues related to, to migrant journeys and how to, how to model uh, migration processes in a mean, meaningful way. I hope that we made a, a small step in the in the right direction, but at the same time, there's so much more to learn about it. That uh, and I think, I think that's probably this open-ended nature of the of the of the inquiries is something at this at this point at this point of the research journey where where we are. It's it's something that that gives us a a real hope that there are, there are really exciting new avenues uh, to be to be explored. Great, thank you so much, Jakub. Thank you so much to all participants in this meeting. And uh, we'll let you know when this gets, when the book gets published and uh, when the, the webinar is available on our YouTube channel. See you in our next event. Thank bye you. bye. Thanks for joining us.